From Embark's brand new headquarters in Dallas, Texas, this is Accounting Matters, an accounting podcast powered by Embark. Hi, hello, good afternoon. It's great to be with each of you. I'm Zach Smith, Embark's East Region Market President, and I'm joined by my co-host, Adam Olson, Embark's Accounting Advisory Practice Leader. In this week's episode, we'll be addressing a topic that most growing companies will need to eventually address, the first year audit. Joining us for this conversation is Donna Boone, a senior director from Dallas and our accounting advisory practice. Adam, Donna, thank you so much for being here. Of course. Of course. Where else would I be? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, hey, listen, I know that this is going to be an exciting topic and obviously something that a lot of companies are going to need to handle at some point in their life cycle. So let's go ahead and dive right in, Adam. Sure. Um, talking about these first year audits, help me uh, understand a little bit better and explain the role of what a financial statement audit actually is. Yeah, so the role of an audit's really been foundational to the capital markets for a long time. You know, an audit itself is really just an examination of the company's financial statements and their disclosures. You know, it's performed by an external independent audit firm or accounting firm. Um, but really, the, the, the main driver behind the audit is to provide some sensibility and comfort around the information that management puts out to the users of its financial statements. So that could be um, its board, it could be outside investors, it could be lenders, uh, um, and the like. And so, you know, one thing you got to think about you know, with the purpose of an audit is that a lot of times the people preparing the financial statements, you know, namely management and their accounting and finance teams, they aren't the users of the financial statements themselves, right? They're helping to prepare that information, but you know, a lot of times they aren't the investors, they aren't the lenders, um, they aren't the general public that is using that financial information. And so the need for an audit provides that additional comfort that the information that that group is you know, compiling and putting together and putting out there for those users is, is you know, materially correct. Okay, so helpful. Um, but tell me a little bit about some of the circumstances that would warrant a company to need to have an audit. It doesn't sound like this is something that every company needs to have. So when, when do they need to have them? When sure. do they not? What does that look like? Yeah, it's going to vary. Um, you know, every company goes through a different kind of growth life cycle, but with every growing organization, there's, there's common inflection points and in when an audit would be necessary. Um, and just the timing when that happens is what will vary. But generally when, you know, an organization gets to the point where they need to potentially take in outside capital. So they're bringing in outside equity investors, or maybe they're looking to get financing from a third party lender. Um, a lot of times as conditions of that investment or those, those lending activities, there's a requirement to produce audited financial statements so that those people can understand what they're investing in, you know, how that company's performing, um, making sure that the decisions that are being made, you know, make sense for them to want to hold that investment, or from a lender perspective, um, that there's there's no risk in, in the financing that they've provided. Um, you know, other circumstances could just be, you know, things around like a private equity firm, um, maybe through a change of control transaction, of acquiring an entity. Um, and as part of that transaction, you know, they require all of their portfolio companies to be audited with the intention that down the road, they may look to dispose of that company and sell it. And so having audited financials generally increases the value of a company because it provides credibility to the information you're, you're, you're putting out there in the public to potential buyers. Um, you know, sometimes smaller companies their first initial stab into um, the capital markets might actually be through an IPO. So maybe you've got like a founder, a founder business that has grown rapidly and now that founder is looking to bring in outside capital and instead of looking for maybe a private investor, they want to go down um, kind of a public offering route. And so in anticipation of the IPO, there's a need to have obviously audited financial statements as part of the registration. 
Okay, so uh, we know firsthand what founder business rapid yep. growth looks like here. Um, and we've talked a little bit about, you know, obviously providing some comfort around the financials, increased transparency in and of itself. Those are key to an audit. But what are some of the other benefits that a company uh, having an audit of their financial statements would receive uh, from having this being conducted? Yes, yeah, so some of the other benefits, you know, maybe I should backpedal. I think a lot of times if you ask someone like, what's what's good about the audit, you know, usually the people that are directly involved with the audit at the organization, there's like nothing, right? It's a pain, um, especially a first year audit, which I know we'll get into today, just some of the, the issues and complexities and things that can arise. But, you know, as part of the audit process, you know, your auditors are doing more than just validating the financial statements themselves. They they're also kind of opening up insights into the business and how the business is functioning. And what I mean by that is, you know, part of their audit procedures is also gaining an understanding of how certain business processes, accounting processes, internal controls are operating or implemented. Um, and where there are deficiencies or maybe there's, you know, pitfalls in the organization, they tend to come to light during the audit process, um, especially when it relates to first year audits, right? It's, you know, first year audits, frankly, can be messy um, because they've never been through that drill before. And sometimes things that, you know, get overlooked because it's a, it's a young company that is running a very lean organization. They may not have as many eyes on things that they, they would otherwise have, and the auditors can bring that to light. And so, you know, one responsibility of auditors is that they have to communicate with those people that are charged with governance any potential you know, significant deficiencies or material weaknesses that are identified. So they also provide that insight to those you know, at the board level or audit committee level um, about what they're seeing in the organization itself, which is helpful for companies to you know, put plans in place to address some of those concerns or maybe just open eyes to things that weren't you know, brought to the surface prior to the audit. So super helpful, Adam. A lot of great things that come from an audit, a lot of benefits that organizations can receive. Yeah. Uh, sounds like a lot of work, right? If you don't have the resources and some of the processes or procedures to help support uh, an audit. But now talk to me a little bit about some of the downsides, right? There has to be, um, maybe negatives isn't the right word, but some additional uh, things to consider that an audit doesn't actually satisfy for no. an organization when reviewing the financials. No, I, I think that's a good point. And I guess I would probably characterize it. There's, there are certain limitations to an audit, right? So the biggest one is that, you know, the audit report itself is only providing what is known as reasonable assurance that those financial statements are, you know, free of material misstatement in the case of an unqualified audit report. Um, and that's important to keep in mind is that it doesn't give you you know, use the word absolute, you know, a guarantee that there aren't issues there. And, and that is inherent in just the concept of an audit itself, because, you know, auditors design procedures to essentially bring that audit risk down to a low acceptable level that their audit report is going to, you know, support the financial statements themselves. But, you know, auditors aren't looking at every single transaction. They're not, you know, picking up, looking around every dark corner, trying to figure out is everything actually correct. There's also a lot of uncertainty that just exists naturally in financial statements. So accounting itself is not always black and white. There's a lot of judgments that are made. There's a lot of estimates that have to be made. And so just the introduction of that into the financial statements always creates uncertainty. And you know why auditors will design procedures around those things to help you know, make sure that those seem reasonable. Um, you know, there is a potential that some things get missed or overlooked or, um, you know, facts or circumstances change and all of a sudden, you know, what they thought maybe was reasonable now a year later isn't. And so just kind of keeping in mind that there is only reasonable assurance that comes with the audit itself. Yeah, super helpful, Adam. Uh, lots of things to consider around audits, specifically these first years. But one last question then, sure. as companies are starting to plan to go through a first year audit, what are some of the things they need to be thinking about from when selecting an auditor and from that audit select auditor selection process? Anything to consider or think about? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of things. Um, you know, I think it's important to do your diligence for sure when you're going through your initial auditor selection process, or even if you're 
I mean, this could be applied equally to even a company that's just maybe reevaluating who their current auditor is and potentially looking to change auditors for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, I think one thing to keep in mind is generally in most companies, those that are quote unquote considered charged with governance, so your board or if you actually have an audit committee, they're they are the ones that usually appoint the auditor um, and will select them. And so there's there's a bunch of criteria that those groups will usually walk through or questions that they would ask of their potential auditors. You know, in, in many cases you're talking to multiple audit firms to try to make that selection. So, you know, some of the more common things that people ask about is just kind of what is that audit firm's experience in working with companies that are maybe in a similar industry or of similar size or maybe going through similar pain points that your organization's going through. Um, you know, other points can be what makes that audit firm different from other audit firms you're talking to. You know, maybe they use a lot of technology to help make the audit more efficient or provide more analytics or insight into the company that they're auditing that might be beneficial to the to the company itself. Um, you know, you got to think about, especially for startup companies, you know, sometimes going with a very large audit firm may not be the most advantageous move. If you're so small in comparison to many of their other audit clients, you may not get the level of attention that you would otherwise want just because, you know, your, your small dollars compared to big dollars potentially in the fees, fee sense there. So, you know, keeping that in mind, um, you know, if there are certain technical aspects that are unique to your business, maybe just trying to understand how that audit firm navigates that, um, what kind of expertise they may have in-house, if there's disagreements during the audit process, how do those disagreements get resolved? Um, you know, other things to think about is if you've got maybe a international you know, presence, so maybe you've got operations overseas as well as domestically, like how does your that audit firm potentially coordinate with other member firms of theirs to help facilitate the audit process overseas, or what would be their approach to that? And then I think obviously the big one everyone always thinks about too is just like cost, right? Like, so how, how expensive are you, you know, understanding their fees, um, understanding potentially how the overrun process, a lot of first year audits don't run on schedule, don't finish on time. Um, a lot of things tend to come up that potentially could delay the audit, just understanding the timeline and implications to the cost of the audit if there is a delay. Well, and preparing for some contingency around each of those, right? Yeah. And then the only other thing I would add is, you know, particularly if your first year audit is maybe the result of being acquired. So we mentioned by, you know, private equity, venture capital, something along those lines. A lot of those um, kind of owner groups tend to have relationships with a lot of existing firms. So there may be the case that because based on who your owner is, um, you know, you you automatically are going to have ABC firm as your auditor because they use them on all of their portfolio audits. Um, so, you know, the, the selection process may be a little more streamlined in those cases, but but where maybe there is potential, you know, requests for proposals from different audit firms, you know, these are just some of the things you can think through and, and have conversations around. Super helpful. Don, I wanted to switch over to you and ask, dive a little bit deeper into actually uh, what these first year audits would look like. But before we begin, uh, do you mind giving me a 10 or 15 second uh, overview of your background and share a little bit about your experience in this world? Sure, so I've been in Embark for about a year now. Prior to that, I have an audit background, um, consulting background, and internal audit as well. And I have myself worked on several first year audits as an auditor. Yeah, so you're yeah. a pro in this. Been there, done sure, that. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, that's great to hear, and thanks for sharing that. So, you know, we've covered some of the foundational items around these first year audits, but let's talk about actually co conducting these first year sure. audits themselves. As with anything new, I would assume that there can be quite a few complications uh, for first year audits for newer companies. Adam you know, started to allude to some of those in the previous uh, question, but what are some of the more frequent or common fit pitfalls that we see in these first year audits? Sure, so there are several common pitfalls in a first year audit. Um, two big ones are going to be one, lack of sufficient documentation and record keeping, and the other is going to be lack of proper segregation of duties. Um, as far as record keeping and retention, uh, companies with less mature accounting organizations often lack all the records needed to fully support their transactions that actually underlie their financial statements. And so additionally, these kinds of companies often 
have one person handling multiple responsibilities. So this will lead to a lot of control deficiencies in your audit. And so why does this matter, right? Well, it matters because if the auditor cannot rely on your controls for whatever reason, it's going to really increase their testing. Increase their testing, increase how many samples you're going to request from you and your team, and really take a lot more time out of your team and out of their timeline to actually complete the audit. Um, another thing as far as a key pitfall would be for the accounting team to wait until after year end to actually complete all of their accounting for transactions that happened during the year. The issue is during this time, you're going to be really stressed with answering all of the audit requests, pulling their documentation, and if they're still worrying about prior transactions, it's going to really slow them down as well. So to this point, the level of responsiveness of the company's uh, accounting and finance team really impacts how well the audit goes. Okay, so super helpful, Donna. So with those pitfalls in mind, what should some companies be thinking about to prepare for that first year audit? Think of several things. So one thing would be your commitment um, as a company and as your company management. So this product, this process really needs to be prioritized by your company. So, I mean, even though it may not be considered as urgent as other business priorities, it actually is very important to your investors, to your lenders, and those kinds of people. So it should be prioritized by the company and management overall. So I'm going to pause you right there, Donna. Sure. Do you feel like that is a more prevalent pitfall amongst companies um, and that they underestimate or uh, don't anticipate the true level of commitment required to have a successful first year audit? Absolutely. I think management and those kinds of companies, especially in your uh, hyper growth companies, are really focused on the growth of the company and not so much on their accounting team and their accounting processes and procedures and all of those sorts of things. So they really underestimate what's going to be needed to actually complete that audit for the first time. Interesting. Okay. Anything else that we need to be thinking about? Sure. So your accounting records are extremely important in this entire process. So as I mentioned earlier, one of the key pitfalls of a first year audit is just lack of proper accounting records. So this is often where a third party advisor can really step in and help your accounting team. So for example, say you're on a cash basis, like many high growth companies yep. are, we could come in and we can help you move from cash to accrual accounting. We could also help collect relevant information to help prepare things that the auditors are going to request during your audit process. Then little plug for Embark, this is something that we do here from a firm-wide perspective all the time, correct? Yes, all the time. Yep. Now, have you been involved in any engagements here at Embark that does this audit prep, audit remediation work? Yep, I absolutely have. And so we really kind of work hand-in-hand -hand with management and the auditors and kind of bridge that gap to work with both of those groups. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Love it. What else do we have? Uh, just your process that you have. So one thing that's very important is to have someone on your team who really understands auditing and the audit process. Again, Embark is really great at that. I mean, third-party advisors can really help with this. For example, most of our professionals, including myself, do have an audit background and have often worked on first-year audits. So we really understand how the process could and should actually work. Mm -hmm. um, and another thing to consider is just how quickly um, the complexity of financial statements can really escalate. And so to have those advisors in your corner during the process can be extremely helpful as well. So before we keep going, talk to me a little bit more about that. When you say uh, the complexity of the financial statements and how that escalates, what do you mean by that? Many issues will come up most likely. You're going to have revenue recognition. You're going to have stock-based compensation. You're going to have software development possibly. The list can just go on and on. So being prepared and anticipating these complexities will really help along with the audit process. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, another thing to consider, sorry, it's just the time it's going to take to complete this audit. Yeah. We kind of touched on that earlier, but it will take a lot of time from the resources of your accounting and your finance teams to really help move the audit along. So keep that in mind. Okay. So this is great. So lots of things to consider here. Um, you know, what I'm continuing to hear is 
this is a big undertaking for organizations, mm -hmm. right? This is a yeah. big undertaking for new companies. Um, and don't take this decision to go through this first year audit lightly. Right. It's going to require time, effort, resources, but overall what you touched on at the beginning, firm-wide commitment mm -hmm. to the audit in order for this to be successful. So in addition to that, are there any other things that can be done tactically to assist with the first year audit? What are some other tips and tricks you might have for me? Sure. So to help out the auditor, just check and then definitely double check that you have all of your cash and debt accounts that are going to be audited. That's very important to have because in my experience, I've seen so many like last minute scrambles trying to get confirms out and also uh, with AR confirms as well. It can be a real last minute scramble to get those done. So definitely give yourself time, enough time to send those out, get them back. And then if not, do alternative procedures um, if you don't get your AR confirms back. Okay. So I know one time I was sent a confirm and I got it and I filled it out and I mailed it back and I must have saved them so much time. So yeah. Go start for me. That's great. Anyway, um, another thing is just to remember to document, document, document. So unfortunately, a lot of companies, as we've mentioned before, just kind of fail to document things. They just kind of go out to see their pants and don't really worry about that. Well, an auditor is going to care about that, and they're going to want you to have those processes documented and those procedures in place. And if you don't have those, again, it will really slow down the audit process. Okay, so what I'm hearing, Donna, is that there's just a constant tension because You've got these new organizations, new companies, hyper growth, focused on delivering their product or service or whatever that is, focused on the top line. But then at the same time, somebody needs to slow down to document, uh, you know, any and everything that they're doing, which, you know, being a part of hyper growth organizations, we know that doesn't happen all mm -hmm. the time. So I would, it sounds like there's just a constant push and pull or a tug between yeah what the first year audit needs and what the company's truly focused on, right? Yeah, and even if, you know, your accounting or finance teams, you know, they're not maybe being strategic on the operational side of growing that business, they're probably being pulled for a lot of information aside from what's just needed for the audit for, you know, the C team or whoever to help drive that strategy. And so it's important, I think also, we've talked about third party kind of external advisors to help with the audit process. If you think you're gonna need that, like, making that decision and planning for that earlier in the audit process is going to be much more effective than you're kind of in the final weeks of the audit and you Love realize, power. oh crap, you know, here we are, I've got all these things outstanding, I've got so many things going on and really trying to struggle and find someone to help you out and pull you through. Um, especially when you do have audit deadlines, you know, we've, we've mentioned that, you know, sometimes having lenders, for example, is a reason that you need that audit. Well, those lenders, a lot of times will have covenants which require the audit report by a certain date. If you're going to slip and miss that date, sometimes there's penalties involved with that, removing that covenant. Um, so just things to keep in mind. And if you are going to need that outside help, to just think about that earlier in the process and really get that lined up. Yeah, super helpful, Adam. So Donna, back to you. I know in an audit, you're required to provide access to a lot of information. Mm -hmm. Uh, for example, significant agreements or contracts. Mm -hmm. What's the best way to provide that information to your auditor? The best way is to have a shared drive between you and your auditor, and then just put all of your important files in there, just like you mentioned. So you'd want to put um, debt agreements, equity agreement, articles of incorporation, contracts, vendor agreements, things of that nature, all in that one drive. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and since materiality drives how auditors actually scope and perform their audits, mm -hmm. is there anything companies can do to get ahead of the curve or on what their auditors may be looking into? Sure, I would try to estimate what the auditor's materiality will be. This can be a percentage of net income or maybe your EBITDA revenues, whatever most relevant for your company. So once you have your expected materiality, uh, start analyzing your subledger and those details, um, and then compare those subledgers to your trial balance. And you want to make sure that any differences that you have, if any, are going to be immaterial. Um, once you do that, you'll want to analyze your material GL accounts, Look for any key items that the auditors are probably going to ask for and go ahead and pull that information in advance so it's just ready to go. Okay, so I love it. Lots of front work that needs to happen to continue to help uh, expedite, if you will, or mm -hmm. maybe even keep on track a first year audit, right? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of folks probably don't realize the amount of pre-work that needs to happen for these. What are some things that companies though should be thinking about when it comes to allocating resources to this audit, right? Lots of pre-work, 
lots of work during the audit, probably even some work post audit and follow up, right? So how do we need to be thinking about resource allocation from a people perspective and timing uh, for each of these audits? Okay, so you want to identify someone internally who's going to be that point person for the audit team. Someone's going to receive all the PVC requests, disperse those to the appropriate stakeholders, receive those back, get appropriate answers back to the auditors. This is really key as far as the project management piece of the audit and to keep everything moving. Also, it just gives your auditors one key contact instead of having to track down many people across your organization. Um, another thing is to communicate a plan for key events, such as fixed asset counts, um, inventory counts, things like that. You'll want to figure out your dates and then work backwards to plan the audit out that way. Those are big activities that an mm -hmm. organization is undertaking. Exactly. And so to be able to factor in the time required for that and then backdate is important. Exactly. Okay. Very, very important. Mm -hmm. um, another thing also is kind of to think about who will be included in this audit. This might be your legal, tax, manufacturing, like plant controllers. You want to give them a heads up of what's expected of them and of their time as well. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Donna, super helpful and insightful. Let's go ahead and round this out though with any final considerations on the reporting side. What are some things that the companies need to be keeping in mind here and thinking about? Sure, just don't put off writing your footnotes. People often push this to the very last minute. It can really be a scramble at the end to get those done. So on the front end, try to get your auditor's disclosure checklist and kind of work from that as early as possible. Perfect. Super helpful. Oh, Adam, I, anything you want to add? I would like to add something here, yeah. just from my own experience here. I agree with the disclosure discussion for sure, especially when there's new disclosures related to new, you know, new accounting standards or maybe a, a unique or significant transaction during the year. But the other big thing I see a lot of companies put off where auditors tend to find a lot of errors is the cash flow statement. It's like the forgotten statement of the financial statement. So just making sure you're not waiting too long to prepare that cash flow statement because it can cause quite a few headaches at the end of the audit. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So we've dived into a lot of different things around first year audits. What I'm hearing is the time, the effort, the commitment from the organization's perspective for completion of the audit is as important as actually getting a good auditor and hiring the auditor and getting through the audit. Any final takeaways that we want to leave with our audience? Yeah, I guess one I would, and we've probably said this in, in a few different ways during our conversation, but like communication, like throughout the audit process is, is critical. And I mean, communication between the, the company itself. So whether you've got this point person that you kind of set up to be the project manager of the audit, um, as well as the audit team. And that starts even before they even begun their audit procedure. So during the kind of the pre-planning, just understanding the timeline of the audit with your auditor, knowing when certain requests are gonna come in, when they need to have certain information by in order to keep this timeline as close to the original set date as possible um, is important. And then as the audit progresses, you know, having regular cadence and touch points. So a lot of times, you know, established meetings, whether it's on the daily, weekly, whatever basis makes sense for the audit, but to really understand what's the status of the audit, where are things at, where are we slipping maybe that we're falling behind on our timeline, you know, where do we need to maybe allocate new resources in the company to help support, or maybe bring in an external advisor to help us here because now all of a sudden, you know, as you mentioned, things have fallen behind late in the game, we gotta, we gotta react quick. Um, you know, understanding where the audit is moving and then as you kind of get into the finalization of the audit, just kind of knowing what those audit findings are, um, understanding maybe what's going to be communicated to your board or the, the audit committee um, as they kind of wrap up the audit itself. Yeah, thanks Adam. Donna, anything you want to add? Sure, I'll just say, and I said this already, but I'll repeat it again, that having that one point person is very important. Someone on your management team who understands both your accounting and finance processes as well as understands the audit process as well. That'll really help out both sides to really move the audit along. And plus, sometimes people who aren't as experienced in audits may lead the auditors down the wrong path, and that can really waste time on both sides. So really keep that in mind if we pick is very important. Yeah, super helpful. Adam, Donna, thank you so much for making some time for us for season two of Embark's Accounting Matters podcast. I appreciate you both being here and I hope you guys have a re great rest of the week and we will talk to you next time. Thanks.